People who abuse us, we should not be saying, but they really love us. If someone is abusing you, as painful as this might be to hear, they don't love you. They treat love like money. It's not love for connection. It's love to get what they want. The worst thing that you can take away from a child who's dependent upon you is your love and your connection. There is no such thing as a narcissist liking a boundary. They're not going to respect it. In fact, they're gonna be like, oh, I'll take some notes. It's insane to leave a child feeling without love and to enjoy doing that because you're gonna get some result. Love is a, is a commodity. It is not love itself. It is not the authenticity of what love is. It is just used as any other weapon can be used. Welcome back, everyone, to Diary of an Empath podcast. Today's guest is Sherry Campbell. She's a psychologist and the author of the book, Adult Survivors of Emotionally Abusive Parents. She's also a podcaster of the show, Sherapy Sessions, and a TEDx speaker. So Sherry, how do you define your mission and why you do what you do? I'm a survivor prior to a PhD expert, right? I have all those accolades, but that is not what makes me good at what I do. I just wanted to give voice to the scapegoated children out there who are cut off from family or who have been forced to cut off from family to save their own lives, but really more importantly, to break the cycle of toxic family abuse coming down from the parent to child. What do I need to understand about your past in your childhood to understand how you got to where you are today and maybe why you got into this work? So I was raised by two toxic parents. Um, my dad was violent and cruel and emotionally out of control. He was in cults. He was an unsafe person. And my mom is a 14-year-old sadistic, calculating, mean girl. Um, both of them were unpredictable, unstable. There's nine marriages between the two of them. Um, and I was really not coping well. I have a sibling um, who, who I thought at the time was coping better. Um, but really, my mother, I think, hates women. And she hated me and adored him. Um, I wouldn't want to be him today, which is sort of liberating to know, but um, I was very much in alignment with the truth as a kid and wasn't surviving all the lies very well. And it was affecting my behavior, my grades, my, my, my sense of value, my worth, my ability to want to go on in life. And um, I was punished for all of that. So there was really no no uh, stability for me growing up. And they would both dose me with kindness for sport when they needed me to stay addicted to the drama and not get too alignment with in the truth so that there wouldn't be a place for me to have any justice. Mm. I know so many relate to that story. I relate to that story in many ways. And it's hard because, you know, and I work with a lot of borderline personality. And I hear this reoccurring theme of emotionally unstable parents. And by no means, not everybody has BPD, right? But we all cope in, in the best ways that we can. For you, it seems like you made the, the absolute best of it that you can, because you're now in a position to help others. But there's so many that didn't have those resources, or they weren't able to figure out coping mechanisms. For you, like, was there a pivoting point where you look back at your life and you could say, okay, I could have got, gone down this road, but I went to the right instead. And how did you cultivate that? Because I know there's a lot of people listening that are struggling. So this is going to just sound so twisted, but I became anorexic from 16 to 18. And I, I think it kind of saved my psychological life. I don't encourage it, <laughs> okay? But it got me into therapy, okay? And my therapist, I'm 53, I'm ancient. So 
labeling and narcissism and borderline and all the things. It just was not discussed back then, but I was certainly told that I wasn't the cause and source of the family problems. I was a symptom of my trauma and I finally was seen. And I would say that in fifth grade, when I was suicidal, a woman came into my life for one night and she got me through that moment. And then another family came into my life, my senior, well, probably like my sophomore year in high school when I had like a 1.6 GPA, I was crushing it. Um, And I think that their influence was a pivotal point of change. Um, Then I got into therapy and then going to college and getting my body away from the abuse. Because at that point, it was really... Well, again, there's nine marriages between my parents. So I was dealing with tons of step parents, step kids. When whenever my parents would divorce, they'd change. Then when they'd meet someone else, they'd change. So my life was constantly having to freaking change. Um, but I think I did. I was blessed in that I think I had critical people come along at a time when I was at such a peak low that gave me a little bit of hope again. Um, And I saw that therapist for five years. And then I think really moving out of the state, getting further and further away from the poison just helped me. So I think maybe not everybody does have those critical people show up at some point in time. You know, I'm very much a universe girl. I, I believe that I was destined to have this purpose And I believe that turning my predators into my purpose instead of my downfall has has been an unexpected turn in my life. I never had an intention to write a book, let alone five. So I do feel that along the way there were people. And I think if we just look out for them or we want them, I think we can manifest them. I think we need them. Um, None of those people are in my life today. They were just sort of crossroads, crossroad moments that they, thank God, showed up. Yeah. Shout out to your therapist too, right? Some therapists are just here to do God's work, especially the ones that um, are, are really telling you like that, that the trauma does not have to define you. I had a, um, I had an upbringing that was so chaotic, right? And I, just like you, I, I'm a, I'm very spiritual and I believe that the universe presents us with lessons and we, we get to make choices based off those lessons, but there's a purpose for all of us. And part of my purpose was to be where I'm at, but I never thought in a million fucking years that I would be doing podcasting, that I'd be doing therapy. Like my, my path should not have led me here, but it did very weirdly. And I think about my parents and the emotional immaturity that my parents had, but I didn't really understand that it was not, that it was trauma or that it was emotional immaturity until recently, the last couple of years. So for anybody listening, that's resonating with some of this, what does emotional immaturity look like with our parents? How do we recognize that? Self-centeredness, you know, it's all about them. They don't really ask you about you. They're more excited to tell you about them. Um, If you do things with them, they want to do what they want to do. There's an entitlement to them. They own you. So you have to do what they want. Um, And that, that is that sort of just, they're just self-referential, you know, it's, it's really the center of their own universe. Um, And that parent is quite different from a sadistic parent. Um, my parents were far more calculated and sadistic and and you're not going to be mature and be sadistic. Right. So I kind of had a a different level, but I I think with emotionally immature parents, I think that you don't have to go no contact unless you want to, but if there's not an intent to abuse um, and it's not calculated and they're immature, is it going to be very frustrating relationship for sure? Um, But if you want to maintain contact, you can gray rock that type of parent and deflect the conversation back onto them, which is their favorite topic. And I think you can have sort of some level of a peaceful existence with a parent that's emotionally immature. 
Okay. So when we're talking about sadistic, abusive versus the emotionally immature parent, and I know that this is going to be a common sense question for some people, but for some people, it's not. Some people really are not aware of putting their parent in the same sentence as abuse. So what does that look like? How do we understand, like, no, this was not normal parenting. This is abuse. I went through abuse. Emotionally immature parents are invalidating and sadistic parents are cruel, cruel. And they want to see you react. They want you to get angry and hateful and spiteful and stand up to them. There is nothing more satisfying to a sadistic parent than to disown their own hostility, provoke you to be angry so they can see it all as you. And then they call you the abuser. Um, you're not physically safe. Uh, you're not emotionally safe. Every day is a fucking game that you have to play that you don't get to know the rules to. And you are laughed at and mocked when you fail and you fail all the time. You are shamed. You are made to feel that you are stupid. You are unintelligent. You are too much of something bad, not enough of something good. You need to get your shit together. Stop talking back. It's a no win fight. And even people with sadistic parents will go, God, was it that bad? I stayed for 45 years and people have the nerve to say they think I didn't think this through. Mm. It's your mom though, but it's your family. That's the title of my book. My first book is called, But It's Your Family. So my purpose is to be a disruptor of a cognitively held belief that all parents are good. My TED Talk is called, Not All Parents Are Good. I'm a parent. Not all parents are bad. But I can't even imagine ever, ever being cruel to my daughter. The love I have for that child would never even consider the thought so having her really woke me up to how bad it actually was because when either of my parents would hold her or be around her, I, I felt very much like I had to protect her or I didn't want them to hold her, like they were getting her dirty. It was a strange, strange feeling for me. Nothing I'd ever felt being around them prior. So my body listened a lot more when it was my daughter, because as a kid, I couldn't be in my body. It was too painful to be in my body around these people. So I escaped into my head and did a lot of rationalizing and justifying of why I was so bad, why I was so bad, why I had to get better, why the problems in the family were me. And I was, you know, that narrative about me was burrowing in very deeply. But when it's your own kid, there's something so different that happens inside your body. I was like, oh, no, I am grounded in this one right now. Do not hurt my kid. Right. I didn't trust them to be alone with her. I didn't want them to be. They're mean people. Mm. I have a 15 year old daughter. I I totally understand exactly what you're saying. It's kind of like that fight or flight turned on and you start to see things from a perspective of a mother and it's like, wait a minute. I was told when you have a daughter, I hope she does the same thing to you that you did to me. <laughs> I got that too. <laughs> and yeah. And it's like, okay, but I do have a daughter and she's not doing those same things to me. Where's the common denominator here? Because I'm parenting a lot different and I'm not having these same types of reactions. So maybe I wasn't the bad kid. Maybe I was just reacting. And there's a, there's a quote or something that you posted and, um, I really, really resonated with this. And it says, what our toxic mother doesn't do is take responsibility for her spiteful behavior and make it right. Instead, she victimized tears, dumped the consequences of her joy treatment onto us, her, her children. If we fail to excuse her and make her feel better, we are the bad person for being cold, heartless, and insensitive when our poor mother feels so awful. Yes, that is her. That is cruel. That's not Im immature. That is intentional avoidance of taking accountability, right? Um, 
I think emotionally immature is very valid. I think that there are many. I think that different levels of abuse require different changes in contact, right? But if I were to look back and really be honest with you, I never had contact. I tried so hard to land any type of truth that we could be in alignment on onto these parents of mine. I, I, I made up ways to find contact. It's just that when there was no contact before, it the, the relationship was verbal and active. So now I have no contact and it's not verbal and it's inactive, but there's no difference. There's no difference, except now I don't have all the frustration and the overworking and the overthinking and being their emotional janitor and slave and trash can. I just don't, I'm not attending those events anymore. Okay. But there was never contact to begin with. There was no connection that they wanted to have with me that was ever going to be based in love. I've never had trouble with my daughter. She's 19. Um, she just finished her first year in college. She's doing fantastic. Um, we didn't go through the teenage fighting years because I have the utmost love and respect for this human being. Um, I feel that I'm obligated to her. I don't see her as having any obligations to me. She's not a piece of property that I own the title to. So I get to dictate how she runs her life and decorates her freaking house. I don't get to do that. Um, I hold her in the highest esteem. I think she's such an angel baby and oh, this world is lucky to have her. And I think she's my gift. I think I got a gift because I had it so bad and I was constantly told, just wait till you have a daughter. Well, best gift I ever had. So at least she prepared me for something great. Ooh, that is preach. I, I feel the, the exact same way. And you know, when I hear you talk about your daughter like that, my mom would never talk about me like that. I don't think I would. And, and if she did, it wasn't in front of me. That's for sure. And same. the way that I speak about my daughter is just, I, I, I told her in the highest regard because it's how I feel about her. She's not an extension of me. I birthed her, but she is her own individual person. I'm in that stage with my daughter where I have like an office crush, <laughs> you know, cause like she, she's, she's like, tw like almost 20 and she's like, like she comes home. I'm like, hi, <laughs> want to have dinner tonight? <gasps> okay. Yeah. You've got plans. It's okay. <laughs> you know, I'm in that phase where she's really separating and I love every phase. I love the office crush. I just adore her. Um, and she's not spoiled. You know, you can adore your kids. I feel like you cannot give your kids too many compliments or too much love. I think you could possibly give them not enough of that and too many material things and you might get a spoiled brat. But I don't have any of that because I honor her character. She's very different than me as well, which which I think is beautiful. And she's so interesting to me. Um, she is just... She's just the everything. And I was never talked about this way. I, I was hated. I was not loved. I was hated and resented. Um, and, and yet it wasn't my choice to be here. So I don't know. I'm powerless now. You hate me and you resent me, but you brought me here. So it's kind of like a no win situation, right? So I do feel that when you grow up like this, you either break the cycle if, if you're the scapegoat, there are some golden children that also get out that are not bullies. Um, they're rare, but, but they're there. That did not happen with my sibling. But I, I feel like there are also some scape, scapegoats that never find healing, right? Um, I think what all survivors suffer with is abandonment syndrome. And I think that we have a lifelong experience of grieving the living dead. So it's just a very different process than a healthy sort of dynamic, right? Where maybe the parents are grossly immature, but tolerable. You can still do holidays. You can gray rock them and it's okay. They don't notice. I tried all that, tried every kind of contact. I made shit up to try, but 
if they weren't getting my, my, my negative reaction or my hurt, my pain or my suffering, they just weren't satisfied. It didn't last long enough to let it work. So, so really I, I didn't have any other choice, but to just what they cut me off, uh, which was a special game they played my whole life. And this time I just said, I'm just like not mending the fence mm, and it'll be eight years, crazy. June 12th. Yeah. You know, my, I'm, I'm just saying that because my, my mom recently cut me off again. It's not me that cuts her off. It's her that will cut me off. And I'm just like, yeah, I'm not playing, playing these games anymore. Um, and it makes me think about the fact like that some of these parents think that if you have a boundary, you're not being respectful, that you're not obeying. So if, if a parent is saying that they expect you to obey, they expect respect, how do we hold a boundary? So let's say we're we're not ready to completely cut off that parent yet, right? How do we start to hold boundaries to start to create that space with a parent who's like highly narcissistic or or thinks that no matter how old you are, you should obey and you should respect? Did you guys know that I'm not only a therapist, but I'm also a coach and a professional tarot reader? Now, it's not exactly me hovering over a crystal ball telling your future. It's a way to connect with your guides on life issues such as career and love and spirituality. And sometimes people need one-on-one -on -one coaching to help them through breakups, toxic relationships, healing the mother wound, their spiritual path, or navigating tools as an empath. So I do all of these things to help my clients pursue life Life and decisions and understand themselves. So if you are interested in one-on-one -on -one coaching or a tarot reading, click the link below to get started. Okay. Back to the podcast. You can't, I'm sorry to say that, but you can't, they, they, they will never honor your boundaries. They might feign that they do to get you back hooked into the dynamic, but if they are truly narcissistic by diagnosis, there is no such thing as a narcissist liking a boundary. They're not going to respect it. In fact, they're going to be like, oh, I take some notes. So really upsets her when I do this noted. So then they'll love bomb you after you have a boundary setting conversation. A couple of weeks will go by and I go eh, right in that boundary you just set. So I know it's not a pretty answer, but I think the most important thing that we we give people is truth, right? We all want to hang our hat on on the idea that we tried, that we uh, we at least set the boundary. Well, boundaries are designed to keep people in our lives, not out. So when we set a boundary, we're saying, if you can love and respect me at these lines of tolerance, then you can stay in my life. Meaning, could you like just be nice to me? It's pathetic, but you set that boundary and um, they'll either acquiesce to it just to keep the game going and keep you, you know, giving you a little dose of hope just to cross that boundary a couple of days later. So if you want to really stay in contact with your family, here's your choice. You need to go along to get along and pretend that your abuse didn't happen and you have to move on as if it did not happen. That is how you stay in a toxic mm -hmm. family. And you yeah, can and do that. You exactly. can. Like if it's you know you're if you know you're doing it, maybe even this. If you know you're doing it as a strategy and that's what you want and you can be abused and act like it didn't happen, you can. I don't know that it, it's until oh. until something <laughs> happens where you piss them off. And then stuff gets brought back up or you're in a place yeah. where, yes. yeah, it, yes. it, it's it, that for me, that's how it was. Like it was me, me ignoring the fact that any abuse happened. I never bring it up because it's worthless. It's not going to go anywhere. And then when we have problems, it's, it's when either that person is not getting the supply that they need in that moment, or I'm not giving into the victimness. And it's then and only then that it's like do or die happens. And then I don't speak to that person for a year or two years. And then I get love bombed and it comes back in the picture like nothing ever happened. So if somebody cuts off their parents and they get to the point where they say, you know what, enough is enough. I'm not going to have contact with this person, with this family member, with both parents. Are we allowed to grieve? What is, what is that dissonance? Because I feel like it's so confusing 
when you're grieving for the same person that has caused you so much pain? Well, we want to be healed by the person who caused our pain. So we wait. I had to learn after 45 years of waiting for them to heal, for me to heal, that this just like was not going to work. Okay. I learned that understanding them didn't change them. I learned that forgiving them didn't make them less abusive. Okay. Healing is not going to come from any closure with these people. Healing comes when you decide it's closed. When I got cut off eight years ago and I chose not to mend the fence and then, you know, I started getting weird, sadistic cards and gifts twice a year. Tolerated that for five years till it was done to my daughter on her 16th birthday. Ended that. Um, cut out of trusts. I mean, just horrific. Um, that abuse was so insane after I cut ties or they cut me off and I didn't mend the fence. They were so angry um, that it really just gave me even more of a clear perspective on what I was really dealing with, right? Um, my grandmother had, had left money for my daughter's four-year education and my mother blocked her granddaughter from her great-grandmother's trust because she's mad at me because I won't tolerate her abuse. That is insane. So keep your fucking money. I'm doing just fine. I'll put my kid through school, which I am. So her idea of mending with me is to put me into terror and starve me back because she didn't believe that I would be able to put my kid through school. Not my fault she underestimated me so deeply, right? Um, it's quite liberating and redemptive, to be quite honest, that I've been able to survive things I didn't think I would be able to. Um, she will never see my emotional carcass laying at her feet. I, I grieve, not her. I'm sad I don't have a mom. That is, saddens me every day. I'm sad that I don't have a supportive, in my corner, that's my princess type of dad. Never did. I'm sad that I had to survive all these freaking stepkids and multiple affairs and all this stuff all growing up. That makes me sad for me. Um, but I have taken that and done something with it that I want survivors to know that happiness is a real possibility for you. Do I have monsters in my basement? Yeah, I do. Uh, do I have to learn about them, sit with them and navigate them? Yes, I do. Is that work every day? Yeah, it is. But it's worthy work for me anymore that, that I can be a composed, elegant, articulate, genuinely authentic woman coming from what I came from to me is, is a miracle that I have been creating and will continue to create. Healing is a verb. There's not an end date unless you get a lobotomy. I, I was recently asked on another show, well, I mean, you have the PhD and you know everybody probably thinks you're healed. And I was like, well, I mean, I, a lobotomy wasn't included with the PhD. I mean, I didn't like check the box. Like, can I please have the lobotomy, <laughs> right? Like my brain is built to hold the memory in my amygdala and hippocampal areas. Unless you really go in and you get rid of all that, uh, I'm going to remember these things all the time and I'm going to be triggered and I'm going to need to learn how to manifest a life where I'm not projecting all the heat from my monsters onto someone current today who's triggering one but didn't create it. And those intersections are an interesting space of navigation. I find it my most passionate pursuit to be articulate and to, to practice composure and to be in alignment with the truth. Because at the end of the day, that's what has saved my life. It's what aligns me in, in being a survivor and not caring if other people don't like me and don't like my truth. I don't care anymore. Changing my truth has never helped me heal. So stay true to what you know. 
and stay on your path. And you will find your way into happiness and to wholeness. Wholeness is not a perpetual state of well-being either. Wholeness is having some really bad fucking days. And being okay with it because that's just part of the human journey and especially one where there's a lot of abuse and trauma involved. What do you think somebody who goes through emotionally abusive parents, emotionally immature parents, how do you think that affects our relationships as adults? especially when it comes to romantic relationships? Well, I'll just use myself as an example. Um, I'm very uh, suspicious. Not in a way where I'm stalking anyone or, 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 you know, in that sort of immature way, more on that level. But I just, people have to earn their way into my life anymore. When I wasn't healing, I was overdoing, overworking, overthinking, overpleasing, and I was running and controlling and doing the, the entire relationship from a place of neediness and insecurity. Um, trusting people, I would force it, and then I would trust all the wrong people. And I had one hard fucking lesson after another. Married my mother, um, and that was a nightmare. And I had to get out of that. It's, it, I've had a lot of moments in my life that I didn't think I was going to survive truly. And for many of those years, they were involved and in, in knowing I was in trauma and making it worse by intent, right? Very satisfied when I'm broken. Um, and I had it all against me. And I felt like that all the time for many years. So I picked a lot of wrong people. And then one year I just took a break. I was like, I don't even know how to be alone. And so after significant breakups, I would force myself to just be alone for a full year. Cause I figure like a baby is a nine month pregnancy and we birth, we birth kind of a fetus for three months and like a baby horse we use like start walking. <laughs> right. And those years that I took were like gestation years. And I studied things like, femininity, uh, the feminine energy. I studied men, nothing but men for four years. It was so beautiful to learn about men. I love men. I love knowing about men. I know, love knowing how their brains are. They're so different than ours. Um, it helped me get rid of some real self-righteous woman shit that I had going on that wasn't serving me. I was very masculine in my relationships because I was doing all the giving. I didn't even know how to receive. I was financially abused to death as a kid. So receiving was very uncomfortable. So I recognize that I'm my, my partner and I've been together eight years. We're raising kids in two different counties. I've got two stepsons and my beautiful daughter, and we're such a great little fam bam, the five of us. Um, And just now after eight years, he's learning the deeper things about me because I don't really give tours of my basement monsters to many people. You know why? They don't deserve to be there. Um, so I vet people and, and I trust that my personality is suspicious um, or waiting for the bottom to fall out is a huge habit that I have because um, my bottom fell out over and over with each marriage. Uh, those changes were just, they just bottomed me out. Um And then I recognize that my personality has become suspicious to protect itself. So I've got to honor the things that my personality has done to survive and to undo the things that actually get me in places where I'm unsafe, like over-pleasing, over-apologizing or whatever. Now I have my habits and flaws for sure, um, but I feel like I'm very articulate in explaining my process And I don't really care if it's healthy or not to someone else. If it's where I'm at, it's the best I can do. And, um, you know, my biggest flaw is probably if I'm hurt, I shut down. I just shut down and, and I, and I just can't help it. And instinctively I just go inside and I can be real quiet. I've learned to say I'm shut down right now. (laughs) I'm not stonewalling you. Right. Give me a few days. It's just the way that I work because I've got a lot of noise in my basement that I have to pick through to figure out where you land in the noise. And that is a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of work. 
because no person on my ground floor deserves the heat that they didn't create. They deserve the heat only from what they've done on the first floor. It's very hard for me. Uh, and so I have to go in and do that work. And I'm writing a workbook right now on how to do all this work so that I can be articulate and fair, right? And then also not over own stuff I didn't do, which is more of a habit. You know, I was really not much of a rager or a blamer. I was more like, what did I do? Why are you mad at me? Let me fix it. I have, I've had to get out of all of that stuff. So I shut down so that I don't start that process, right? And I think that healing is beautiful. I think it's, it's not something you should want to have closure on. I hope there's a whole lot in my inbox when I die. Because that will tell me that I've just been living hard and living it well every day and growing and gaining. And, and you know, I, I don't want to feel like I got to some finish line of perfection because that's not what I'm what I'm searching. I just want to be really whole. Mm. I love that. That's that. It's so well put. And I think that, you know, even when I look back at my childhood the the love was weaponized. And so if if that love is given to you and taken away and held against you, 100% going through the world, not knowing who to trust, like who is who is authentic, who is not. And if you don't know how that's modeled for you, and you now go into the world trying to understand love, trying to understand relationships, it could be very, very confusing. And you put toxic parents weaponized love, their love is taken away at the drop of a hat and only given when necessary for your compliance. Explain that to me. They treat love like, like, like money, right? It, it, it's not love for connection. It's love to get what they want. Um, the worst thing that you can take away from a child who is dependent upon you is your love and your connection. And uh, if, if you make life hard enough for that child, then, then they will start adapting to do anything that that person wants so they can maintain the love and connection. And so this is how we end up sacrificing our identities and our purposes for the parent's purpose and identity because they'll take their love away. Just take it away. It's insane. It's actually insane to leave a child feeling without love is completely insane. And to enjoy doing that because you're going to get some result is insane. Love is a, is a commodity to them. It is, it, is, it is not love itself. It is not the authenticity of what love is. It is just used as any other weapon can be used. It's transactional is, is what I'm hearing. Very transactional. And, and also even even deeper than that is that it's mean. Love and abuse should not be coexisting. People who abuse us, we should not be saying, but they really love us. If someone is abusing you, as painful as this might be to hear, they don't love you. You cannot abuse something or someone you love. So yes, it's transactional because it's used for a need meeting game, right? Like one, one birthday of mine, and I don't have any memory of any birthdays past this birthday. Um, I was an Olympic hopeful ice skater. And when I was eight, uh, my mom offered to take me to the ice capades show and I could bring a friend and she was being so nice to me. And I was only eight. I just remember the feeling of like feeling she loved me. And it was a new feeling for me. So we get there and this man and his daughter walk up and he kisses my mom. And I'm like, what is going on? And I remember my stomach started feeling nervous. I was really, my body was like, this is weird. She used the ice capades to go on a date with the divorce lawyer who divorced her from her, my dad, and then my stepdad. And then she married this guy and he brought his daughter who I'd never met and himself to my birthday party. So it's no wonder she was so nice to me. So when this wasn't feeling good to me and I was getting upset and I remember I was starting to cry 
And she's like, you better shape up. Like she got all up in my face and told me I needed to shape up that she brought me to the ice capades. And if I didn't, then you can just imagine how the conversation went from there. All I wanted to do was have someone for me at your birthday. You're the bad guy and it's your fault. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't like this guy after that and he married her. So that wasn't a good way to start off. And she wasn't nice to me after that. And she wasn't nice to me before that. And so that's what I mean. It's like, if they need something, they'll start love bombing you a little bit. And then when you don't like what's being done, because you see what you were just being nice, why the nice was coming. Now you're an ungrateful brat. Okay. I mean, what can the kid do? What could I have done? Nothing. It ruined my birthday. It didn't feel special anymore. It was really for her. What are some signs and symptoms of a true narcissistic parent. So we're talking diagnosable high on the narcissist scale. What are some things that let's say if, if I'm listening right now and, and a lot of this is resonating, what else do I need to know if I need to say, Oh, maybe my parent is a narcissist. So I would even get away from the term narcissist. I would really encourage your following to look up the cluster B personality disorders. Um, some people consider the cluster B personality disorders today, they consider them all a form of narcissism, which is fair because they're all selfish and they lack empathy. But if you're diagnosably one, then you have elements of all five. Okay. And that includes antisocial, which is amoral. Okay. I would really look that up because my mom is actually borderline at her core because she won't let go, but she has a narcissistic and histrionic defense and she's totally amoral. This woman is breaking little lines of morality all the freaking time and she's completely dependent and she is absolutely passive aggressive. So I try and widen the scope because if all I did was research narcissism, I wouldn't think my mom was a narcissist, but here's what they are. They're cruel. They're critical and controlling. They lack empathy. They are pathological liars and manipulators. They are disturbingly immature and selfish. And they have no business having kids. Okay. So when you look at that, that list is in my TED Talk. Um, it's so much deeper than just narcissism. When I really looked at histrionic, passive aggressive personality disorder, it, it, it really helped me more than what the DSM would say about narcissism because it leaves out all these other flavors that really impacted me more than just her selfishness and entitlement, right? And immaturity. Um, all of these disorders are on a continuum. We all have elements of some of them because um, we're human. To be diagnosing these people, you have to have at least five of the nine or five of the 10. So it helped me more to have a well-rounded whole perspective of my mother in looking at all of them than narrowing it down to one. Um, because in looking at all of them, now she had no fucking excuse. Again, had I just looked at narcissism, she probably has three traits of that but it would not be enough to diagnose her. So when I looked at borderline, a severe borderline, which is what I would have, and I looked at uh, passive aggressive personality disorder, the amorality, the dependency, the neediness, the victimology, like it, it, it just really helped to really see what I was actually dealing with and how intense it really was. And so for me, I always encourage in every show <clears throat> to look beyond just narcissism, right? Because I do think as clinicians, we just want a term that just kind of sums it all up, right? Because <laughs> we don't want all the jargon. I hate all the jargon. That is why I say the word toxic um, or poisonous. Um, because all the jargon can be confusing, but if it, it is important to look at all of them, to know all the flavors. 
histrionic just blew me away. And we really don't talk enough about someone we who's don't. histrionic. I bet you, I bet you someone who's listening has never heard that term before. Never heard it. And when I read over it, I was like, huh, Okay. What? So what that, is it? For someone that's listening who who's mm-hmm. never heard this term before, how would you how would you explain Ex- it? Center of attention, extremely dramatic uses inflections in their voice to get attention, the way that they dress. If they're not at the center of attention, they find a way to be, whether it's through illness, injury, drama, victimology, succeeding, whatever. But they think that their relationships are far closer than they are. And there's a huge entitlement. um, And it's just loud, not volume necessarily, but just the way my mother eats is, is just the body language. It's just, she sits at the head of the table. She crosses one of her legs and she just looks at everybody. I mean, it's, I can't even explain that someone can actually eat and you can see a character disorder, but they're always vibrating and, and they, she just can't sit. She's moving and needing attention and moving and needing attention. Um, and it, 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 it exhausted me as a child. Like it just, just, I just needed her to just, shh, shh, shh. just fucking stop. They don't listen. They, they over talk. They talk over you. The only voice they want to hear is their own. They're petulant. They're petty. I mean, it histrionic just knocked my, my socks off. Um, and she has a lot of the borderline traits of just raging and then fearing abandonment, threatening suicide to, to get attention, which is borderline narcissism and histrionic. They, they share a lot of the self-centered needs for attention traits. Um, but ooh, that one was more healing for me to read than some of the other ones. And then I re- really, I would really look up passive aggressive personality disorder. That's a whole other one. Um, withholding things on purpose. <laughs> yeah, I think that we've we've popular popularized narcissism, which is not a bad thing. Like, listen, no, I'm, no, I'm no, so great. happy that people are really becoming aware of yes, what that looks like. Um, whether it's high on the scale or you know medium on the scale, I'm glad that everyone is is listening and recognizing what's toxic and what's not. But there are so many other different types of personality traits that are similar to narcissism, right? But that are so fascinating when you actually look into them. But I think bottom line here is what I'm hearing from you is that toxic is toxic, right? If you know it doesn't feel good, it it, it doesn't, you're not happy, you're not fulfilled, it's transactional, you're, it, you're drained when you see this person. I think that's enough to know rather than like, okay, I got to find a label. Because if I find a label, and I can explain this person's behavior, then maybe I'm not the problem. I don't think you need to have the label to know that you're not the problem, that that you are a victim of abuse. And you can listen and have to the right your, to cut it off. Right. Listen to your body. If you dread seeing someone or you have to really prep yourself to see somebody um, or you're, you, you get around this person and your heart rate's elevated, you start getting into fight or flight, this person isn't good for you. If it doesn't feel good to you, it's not good for you. Who cares what they're diagnosed as? If it doesn't feel good to you, it's not good for you. And that's how I live and die by. I don't really care what someone's diagnosis is. If it doesn't feel good to me, then it's not good for me. And maybe that's me. Maybe that's personal to me. Well, I care about me. So I'm not going to do things that aren't good for me. I don't care who the person is anymore right? If I have a client who's driving me insane and is making me feel those ways in my body, I terminate that client. Ooh, that's period. That's a good one. I terminate that client and I do so gracefully and articulately, but I know that if I don't feel safe in the relationship, it is not going to be effective therapy. That's true. So there's ways that you can word that And I find the ways to word that, you know, if there's an entitlement and they're canceling all the time or they're wanting extra sessions or blowing you up outside of session and they're feeling like 14 people instead of one, I just do not treat those people anymore. As soon as I sniff up on that's happening, I start to tell them that there's an adherence to my cancellation policy. If this cannot be followed, it's not effective for the relationship, blah, 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 right? 
So I don't even treat clients. I don't have anyone in my life who puts me into fight or flight. I want to be effective in this office and I cannot do that if I am feeling fight or flight, right? We're human before we're experts or therapists. So I want to be effective in my life. And so I listen to my body. The problem with trauma survivors is we escape our body and we get into our heads and we try to think our way through all the things and we rationalize and justify our own abuse. And we, we start just going, I'm just going to pretend it didn't happen. I'm going to compartmentalize. I'm going to turn to vapor. I'm just going to get out of my body. And it took me a long time to get back into my body uh, where the pain is and where the feelings are, because I just do want to be in alignment with what's truthful for me and what's authentic to me, whether it's a client, a friend, a partner, or a parent, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't feel good to me, then it's not good for me. What's the number one thing that kept you safe? Honestly, transitional objects, Little House on the Prairie, those books, fifth grade, suicidal that year, saved my life. Little Orphan Annie, uh, God, I loved her. I loved her. Hard Knock Life, I listened to on repeat on my little record because I'm old. <laughs> um, and The Sun Will Come Out Tomorrow. I just, that song for me, when I was her age at that time, I was nine when Annie came out and she was nine, I think. And uh, I listened to that. My skating program was to Annie. Um, I talk about that movie quite for a moment in my new book on emotionally abusive parents because, God, I wanted someone to see me the way Grace saw her in the orphanage. I wasn't an orphan, but I was certainly living with the heart of one. And um, I wanted someone to save me and love me like she was going to get loved by Daddy Warbucks. And at the end, she's running for her life up these train tracks that somehow they, they lift up in the sky like a bridge or whatnot. And Punjab saves her by helicopter before she were to meet her psychological death of adult predators trying to get her, right? So it was very synonymous with my life. Pippi Longstocking was another hero of mine. Um, and I had... I didn't like dolls. I think I didn't like dolls because I was a little girl and I wasn't liked, but I loved stuffed animals. And I created a whole network in there, a family for me in my imagination. And those are called transitional objects in psychological terms, according to objects relations theory. And those objects parented me. And really I was parenting me, but through pretend and through something else that I could see and access outside of me. And they kept me safe at night. And I could come home to them at the end of the day. And when I was bad and I'd go to my room, at least I would go to little animals that I imagine loved me. That stuff saved my life as a kid. And then I would say for me as an adult, movement has been medicinal for me. Movement, moving my body, running, exercising, eating well, taking care of my foundation and my basic needs and reading and journaling is a lifeline for me. Mm -hmm. And therapy Dr. sharing. Yeah. Oh, definitely mm -hmm. shout out to therapy because it yes. does, it does work <laughs> if you find a good one. Uh, yep. Dr. Sherry, thank you for coming you on the bet. show. Uh, yeah. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for being open and vulnerable and honest because it's not easy to talk about your trauma and to do so in a vulnerable way to show up authentically, especially as somebody who is in the therapy field. I think a lot of people put on a mask to say, here I am. I know I know what to do. I have the answers, but I'm not, I've never gone through this and I don't need to talk about it. So to be vulnerable takes a, quite an enormous amount of strength. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you for doing what you do behind yes. the scenes. And I will link your book for everybody to go buy and go read, because if you have gotten this far in the episode, then chances are this is resonating <laughs> for you. Get the book. Um, what, what are you doing these days and where can people find you? So I have my own podcast that um, is really getting great reviews and, and um, that is called Sherpy Sessions. I, I can't even believe the reviews I get on the show. I uh, just try to take what I do in my office and spread that out a little bit. Although it can substitute for therapy, I think people are finding it very helpful. Um, my TED Talk is on YouTube. It's called Not All Parents Are Good. And I've written 
many, many books. So drsherrycampbell.com is my website. You can find me on Instagram at dr.sherry, same with TikTok. And then it's Sherry Campbell PhD on Facebook. And I've got a beautiful, large, brave-hearted following of a very connected community. I actually am really thankful that my community is very interactive and um, we all really love each other. So if you need the love, you can come and join us. All right. We'll link everything for everyone to uh, go find you. Thank you again for coming on the show. You bet. Thank you.